so many Americans are used to thinking of the U.S. as like you know superpower. We have the deterrence capability, but right right under our noses, we're losing our international power. And if that happens, we, like when it comes to like China being like, all right, we're ready to fight, we might suddenly find like we we don't have all the cards we thought we did. Yeah, we. I mean, wait, we don't have. I don't know how to, how to describe it. You know, it's sort of like if they're if they're playing with those like ninja cards that you kind of could throw and cut people to death with, right? And we're playing fish. Like it's more like that. Like you yeah. know, we're not even doing what we should be doing with the cards, right? So we have cards. We have you know Grant Newsom, who's also been on your shows, talked about you know we have the we. I mean, the U.S. has the global reserve currency. We have global banking systems. We have a lot of economic levers that we're not using. So. We we have cards, but it comes down to political will, and I'd say to to an understanding, as you're saying, of where is the front line? It's, it's not in the Atlantic, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, but, I think this is you know you say the political will. The political will is driven by what the population thinks, and if the population doesn't know what, <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're we're not we're not quite in uh, in our totalitarian totalitarian hellscape yet. Uh, I think if the American people and other Western democracies are aware of like the Pacific Island Forum and the importance of these these countries, then that might be might push politicians' hands. But like I, I can see how like you know oh the U.S. is giving millions of dollars to Kiribati. Why should someone care about that in the U.S.? Why? Well, you can if you if you want, and this is again the difference between Australia and New Zealand. You you can tell that story. The Australian media told the story of Daniel Sudani, which lets the population know what's at stake, which gives the political support for those decisions. Mm -hmm. Or you can kill the story and not have to make that decision. So it's a, you know, if you're looking at the Daniel Sudani case, I mean, mer mercifully, he's okay. He's, his health is okay. But there were a lot of people in Western capitals who would have been perfectly happy if he died. Right, that Wellington would have been very happy if this problem just went away. That's how far off base we've gone. When you've got an honest, hardworking, democratically elected leader and you want him dead because it's more convenient for you, you should probably rethink, you know, what you're doing as a as a nation. Well, and Sudani is not out of hot water yet. There's some rumors that once he goes back to the Solomon Islands, he might be put in prison for treason. Yes. And this raises another issue because uh, Solomon Islands has a history of civil wars and uh, the Australians uh, led a kind of peacekeeping force there called Ramsey relatively recently. And if he goes back, he's very popular and he's arrested for treason. There is a chance that the civil war might reignite. And if it reignites, the central government is at this point more likely to invite in Chinese peacekeepers than Australian peacekeepers. And this is something that the Chinese have been positioning themselves for for a while. They've been uh, doing peacekeeper operations in Africa. They say HADR is going to be part of their um, kind of remit going forward. It's one of the justifications for such a big navy floating around the Pacific. So it's not all of the pieces are in place for that to happen. But there's a lack of understanding of how far this has gone already and how quickly this could tip over. That uh, we're not we're not dealing with it when it's relatively low cost. Well, do you see a scenario where you have Chinese troops supporting one side of a Solomon Island civil war and Australian troops supporting the other side? No. So you think just Australia would not get involved at all? The cost, the at that point, the cost becomes very very high for Australia. Hmm. You know, the, and it's easier for them to say, you know, we're going to we're going to work with them on this and like the climate negotiation type stuff, you know, <laughs> global cooperation. And isn't it nice that the Chinese are stepping up and taking up their responsibilities as an international stakeholder? Oh, so it would be sold as like a great thing. Well, the, what's the alternative? Well, Australia doesn't want to start a war with China, right? Well, I that's mean... the alternative. <laughs> right? No, no, the war is coming. It's just, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't know whether you've seen that graphic of somebody put out on on Twitter, some Chinese guy put out on Twitter, the in, entire Chinese Navy, all of the boats, the official boats, not even the maritime militia, arrayed against the Australian Navy. So you can find that graphic. It's like four rows of huge, massive ships and aircraft carrier, whatnot, and then like the little Australian Navy. And it's 
it's that kind of psychological warfare, one of the three warfares, right? That plays into the unrestricted warfare, that plays into pushing comprehensive national power, that makes it seem like it's a good idea to let Daniel Sudani die. That, it, that it's just impossible to beat the Chinese Communist Party. That's what they want you to think, but it's totally not. We, I mean, we have all these cards, but the starting point has to be to want to do it. Hmm. Political will, which means people need to pay attention <laughs> and say something. <laughs> Uh, well, talking about how the Chinese Communist Party likes to put up this, like, they're they're so powerful, the psychological warfare. When China talks about we're going to take Taiwan no matter what, is that psychological warfare? Absolutely. Like, that they don't actually mean it. Like, that it's not like, oh, well, we definitely need to unify with Taiwan. We will take it no matter what. They want to make it so that everybody else is scared of stopping them from it. Yeah. They do. That does that doesn't mean they can. I mean, again, it's you know, if you array um, a whole bunch of missiles, including American ones, and and say the cost is going to be really high. And this is where India becomes interesting because uh, in in Western countries there is a a limited, understandable, limited tolerance for loss. You don't want your people to die. I mean, that's you know, so it's very easy to rationalize. A, appeasement, right? And maybe they'll eat us last is kind of the, the way that it's, that it's often put. How did appeasement work in Nazi Germany? Well, that's it. So the, so one country that that is actually willing to fight and did fight and lost 20 men is India. Yeah. Right? So if you're looking at, at the whole map of the Indo-Pacific and not just maritime, but land-based also, India is the only country that has couple hundred thousand troops on the Chinese border. They can open up a second front. They can cause pain at very effectively. And they have a, a will to do it because for there's never been, historically, there hasn't been a problem between India and China because there were buffer states. There was Tibet. There were other countries in between India and China, right? So, and, and that's one of the reasons why Mao did the palm and five fingers thing so that he could, you know, grab that whole, try to grab that whole area. But they're in the Indian strategic community, they're talking more and more about, you know, maybe it's time to liberate Tibet again, or at least a huge chunk of Tibet, like two thirds of it or so. And wow. and that implies that there is a, a, a willingness to fight because they know what's at stake. Just to contrast that to the U.S., you know, like in the U.S., it's like there are people like, ah, should we defend Taiwan? Should we not defend Taiwan? India is talking about taking back parts of Tibet. Yeah, I mean, That's like there was so different. We did that episode where we talked about these people who are writing op eds about how like it's not worth like you know yeah it's not worth sending American soldiers to to die on some rocks or something. No, well, rock, I mean right? that, was, that was South that, China that was, Sea. That was Scarborough Shoal. But, yeah. yeah, but like for Taiwan, it's like well, this could cause a nuclear war. You know that kind of thing where yeah, it's but like. But look at it. If we had, if they had been stopped at Scarborough Shoal, we wouldn't be talking about Taiwan. Yeah. Right. So if we and if we if and if Taiwan falls, what are we talking about next? I mean, again, Grant Newsom wrote that thing. If Taiwan falls, it all goes red. Right. So we, there are five treaty allies in that area. So you don't def, you don't defend Taiwan. Are you gonna what are you gonna do about the Philippines? What are you gonna do about Japan? Yeah, Japan you, is saying like if Taiwan, that's an issue of survival for Japan. That's what uh, the Deputy Prime Minister Taro Aso just said. Yeah, right, which which justifies Japan's use of military to defend Taiwan because mm -hmm. they Japan sees it as life or death, and, and and Japan, some of Japan's islands are actually quite close to Taiwan, some of its southernmost islands. Yeah. yeah, and Japan actually has very good relationship with a lot of the Pacific Islands. So if you're looking at Micronesia, you're actually better off working U.S. and Japan with the Micronesian countries to give them, uh, you know, alternate economic development alternatives. We already see it in Palau. So Palau is a freely associated state, which means it's an independent country, but it has agreements, deep agreements with the U.S. And they've offered a base to the U.S. And the U.S. provided uh, vaccines to all of the freely associated states. So they they haven't had the COVID curse. This has been the Biden administration, correct? Yeah, it's it's been consistent through the through the change in administrations. OK. Yeah. Um, the Trump administration was the first one to put a seat on the Security Council dedicated to Oceania, Australia, New Zealand and Antarctica. So it was the first one to really say we need to look at the Pacific Islands. And it was part it was part of the understanding of the region that came out of that sort of Matt Pottinger national security strategy. And Pottinger, of course, was a Marine and the Marines know the last battle in the Pacific very well. 
it's sort of in, it's in their blood. So they know what those islands are strategically and how this is the front line between Asia and last time it was Japan, this time it's China, and how important they are. So Oceania was front and center in terms of how to construct that strategy. So they were have, were very good at building up those relationships with especially the Micronesian countries. And it's been continued now. And, and this is why, especially compared to what the U.S. has been doing, you can see the problems that are happening with New Zealand. So the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, uh, has, which is the defense money for defense, has provisions for looking at Oceania. Uh, there's a, a, a act through Convert, I think Blue Pacific, uh, Ed Case out of Hawaii has been pushing this as well. It's, it's bipartisan. So there's stuff happening within the U.S., but the, the question is how to do it. Do you do it with Japan, just Japan in the north? Do you bring in the quad through it, the, through it all of Oceania? And I think it takes a, a really deep rethink about allies and about who actually is going to be there. I mean, there's something that one of the somebody says, you know, when you go through the window to breach the building, are you sure the guy's going to be behind you to back you up? Mm. Right. I mean, I kind of want to go back to what you were saying about all the things that happened in the Pacific region under Australia and New Zealand's watch, like BRI and all this stuff. Why do you think that happened? Do you think they weren't paying attention? Do you think they were welcoming China coming in? So there were two there were two factors. Uh, one was, I think a, a lot of them were fine with China coming in um, for their own economic benefit. They thought this is this these are the sort of decisions that went into Darwin, for example. Um, the The other was, uh, and you see it particularly with New Zealand again is there is a definite arrogance and condescension towards the region. And uh, the idea that, you know, they can handle China and they can handle the Pacific and they know what they're doing and they know the Pacific better than anybody else. And, you know, we're going to broker all these deals and and it'll be fine. So I think it was a combination of, uh, you know, arrogance bordering on um, racism in some cases, combined with not actually thinking China was a serious threat. Yeah, it's it was it's ugly. And and you asked about what the people of the, how the people of the Pacific see it. And the people of the Pacific, I mean the the ones that I've spoken to, they see the in, increased interest from China at least initially as beneficial because it increases their negotiating position with other with other countries. So they can get more out of Australia and New Zealand and the US and Japan and stuff by raising the China threat, right? They they're not stupid. Yeah, but the problem is once they get sucked into sucked into it too much, then uh, they there's a problem because at the same time China's doing something the others aren't, which is pushing in newly arrived Chinese at the base of the economic pyramid. So in a place like Tonga, Chinese have taken over about eighty percent of the local retail sector. So if you're out in a village on a remote island and there's one shop, it's probably run by somebody from Fujian who has no interest in your country. He's there, he and his family are there for five to seven years, suck out as much money as possible, and then either move to Australia, New Zealand, or go back to China with the cash. So they're not going to give you credit. You know, if you need baby formula for your baby, you're not going to be getting it from the local Chinese shop in the village that's the only village you and your family has ever known forever. So that doesn't m engender warm feelings, 